You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. Hello, 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 zoo enthusiasts and zoo travelers. Welcome to the latest entry to a new series that gives you a general breakdown of what a certain zoo has to offer, my opinions or concerns, and maybe a few tips on how you can make your visit a little better. Today, we'll be heading to the Detroit Zoo, home to 2,000 animals from 250 species and exhibits that will make your eyes pop. Before I give you the breakdown, first things first, buying tickets. One general admission and parking, I paid $31, which from experience is slightly more expensive than usual. For now, and hopefully not forever, you do need a timed ticket if you're going to buy online. And I had a slight complication buying this. In fact, I almost gave up going to Detroit entirely. Long story short, it took me 45 minutes to realize that the website would not let me do anything until I included parking as part of the purchase. Since I'm technically within driving distance, I've never had to stay overnight in the city, so I can't give you any tips on that. But I can say that the city seems fairly easy to drive through, especially around the zoo. Let's say you need a plane to get here. I also know that the airport is very easy to deal with as well. There is a parking garage on the zoo grounds, and you can enter and leave it without having to scan a parking ticket. The zoo sits on 125 acres. The grounds actually reminded me a lot of the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. The entire zoo is flat, there's a decent amount of exhibits, and some of them take up quite a bit of room. Yet, somehow, there's still a lot of space in between most areas, which makes you feel like you're walking a lot more than you actually are. If you take my route, you will walk approximately three and a half miles from entrance to exit. Right out of the gate is the 20,000 square foot modernized iceberg known as the Polk Penguin Conservation Center. Detroit claims this as a whole is the largest penguin attraction in the world. It's a museum dedicated to Sir Ernest Shackleton's legendary Antarctic expedition, and there just happens to be penguins. You're invited to climb aboard Shackleton's ship and watch it trudge through hostile Antarctic waters in this three-wall experience. Below deck are underwater portals to other sub-Antarctic creatures. There's a gallery of Shackleton's voyage and, of course, the most fun you will ever have with penguins in the underwater tunnel. When you exit, you'll immediately be invited to explore the wild Wildlife Interpretive Gallery. Unfortunately, it was closed for a private event on my latest visit. I don't quite remember exactly what it is, but I do remember there being a beautiful walkthrough atrium with birds and butterflies when I went a few years back. If you stick to the right side of the zoo, it won't be long before those imaginary cuteness overload alerts start lighting up at your next stop. It doesn't initially look like one, but this is one of my favorite river otter habitats. Even though the moat makes it look like you can't get any closer, this parallels with a cabin style viewing, which is perfect for those hot summer days. Actually, I don't know if you guys get those up there. I've been in June, July, and August, and the weather has always been kind of cool. Anyways, the flow of the stream drops into a deeper pool with un underwater viewing. Let's say for some reason otters just aren't your thing. Well maybe you'll be more interested in the beaver habitat that's right across from this. It reminded me a lot of the Columbus zoos which is now destroyed. Either way this one is way better. Problem is I'm convinced the public has never ever ever seen them and that's why there's a live cam of their den. Don't be one of those people that continues to walk past the beavers. Just before these giant rodents, you're gonna wanna take a left into Amphibaville, the most underappreciated part of the zoo. When you do come here, give some love to the National Amphibian Conservation Center. Opened in 2000, the zoo claims that this was the first major exhibit entirely dedicated to amphibians in an American zoo. Even if many of them are behind the scenes, it's home to thousands of frogs, toads, newts, salamanders, and more. Again, if that's not your thing, at least come in here for the giant salamander. Even if you just see its tail, you won't regret it. This building goes hand in hand with the two acre wetlands boardwalk trail, a great representation of, well, natural wetlands. So you have the Penguin Conservation Center, Amphibian Conservation Center, and the boardwalk spits you out in front of the Reptile Conservation Center. I remember not being the biggest fan of this, but after last time, I don't know what I was thinking. Other than the tiling and the outdated ambience, I thought this was pretty spectacular. The terrariums are three times larger and three times more detailed than the average reptile houses that I'm used to. They continue in a line along the back wall from entrance to exit, and the naturally lit part in the middle has even larger open-topped enclosures so you can watch the reptiles from above. 
There's about 35 species on display, but the building's scale jewel is this massive water monitor whose name, I think, is Solaire. Just to the right of this, the Asian forest kicks off the zoo's long list of large fields with every Detroit native's favorite Bactrian camels and white-lipped deer. Grasslands and arid deserts don't exactly scream forest, but it makes a lot more sense when you literally walk 1,000 feet up the path to the red panda and tiger forest. The red pandas have two sides filled with really tall trees, so if you need help finding them, you can walk in between the exhibits on this rope bridge. The tigers used to have this old tip grotto, but now, even though it's still an old-style setup, it's an understatement to simply say that the welfare was generally improved. If you have trouble finding the kitty, they might be chilling over by the two glass viewing areas. The Asian forest becomes the African forest, sharing the same indoor holding as the tigers or the semi-newly arrived Allen's Swamp Monkeys. I did not get to see them, but there was still plenty of monkey or ape business to go around this area. The Great Apes of Harambe covers three acres. Now in America, that's a lot of space to reserve for just two primates. On one side of the main viewing area, you have a half acre exhibit and one that's an acre and three quarters on the other side. So this should be the the largest individual great ape habitat in America. You'll find a group of gorillas that they just received from my hometown, so it was pretty fun teaching the docents who's who. The crowd, however, was a little more interested in the chimpanzees, and the two apes do rotate. Even the bedrooms are a good size, and they have plenty of opportunities to climb and play. And though the signage kind of indicates this area as a whole is a little on the older side, it remains to be one of the most educational ape complexes out there. The space is amazing, but the only complaint I have is that there isn't enough cover for these rainforest animals. The African grasslands really isn't your typical Africa attraction, with never-ending savannas and beautiful lagoons. Everything is just kind of there, and I'll get on that in a minute. There's Detroit Lions, Giraffes, Elands, Japanese Macaques, you know, the usual African animals. To the left of the macaques are lemurs, and to the left of the lemurs is a pretty hard to miss building called the Hangout, which last I heard was home to fruit bats and a South American sloth. Couldn't tell you because the last time I was here it was closed. Since apparently quite a few people agreed that Detroit isn't exactly the best place for an elephant, they were transferred and their home is reserved now for white rhinos. If you do visit in the winter, you can find them inside behind their outdoor paddock. Same goes for the giraffes. If you're like me and you miss that Egyptian theming, there are still some remnants of it near the indoor portion. If it's warm out, of course the giraffes aren't going to be inside, but at least you won't have to wait in line to get a photo with this. African grasslands is 15 acres, which is pretty impressive, but I'll probably skip it on my next time around because the zoo doesn't take advantage of any sort of theming, at least anymore. And overall, there is no variety with the habitat. You could say that it's just one large gray or green cookie cutter paddock after another. And some of them are so large, a lot of people don't have any luck spotting some of the creatures. After walking quite a bit at this point, it's not really worth walking more to see the same exhibit over and over again, containing most species that you can find at any other zoo. But remember this is a nitpick and it does not change the welfare of the animals. You probably don't want to be in the giraffe house if there's no animals, but it's still best to head that way to get to the next area. The Australian Outback Adventure lets you share the same space with red kangaroos and maybe wallabies? I forget. And I won't lie to you, it's pretty much the exact same as any other walk through Australia feature. But the biggest difference is that it's an acre and a half. Again, for those who don't know, that's triple or probably quadruple the size of the average kangaroo pen. If you decide not to be one with the ruse, then go ahead and walk around this giant rock wall and see one of the many examples of the zoo using the footprint of old 1930s style grottos, having them turned into something that's a little more adequate. In this case, three bear grottos combined into one to house the rescued grizzlies they kick off the American grasslands. It's pretty much a repeat of the African grasslands, but if you were to ask me, it might be a little controversial, but it has way more interesting animals. The wolves were definitely a highlight for me. Not just because they make excellent photography subjects, but I overheard a local say they've been coming here for years and they've never seen them. I got lucky apparently because we were told the pups were active because Storm, the ultra mega certified good boy, was paying them a visit. 
It was nice to once again see bison, rescued bald eagles, animals from the South American grasslands, and I loved coming across farm animals in a farm-like environment with plenty of space rather than a cramped pen with a giant group of kids that can't wait to pet them. If you've heard of this place, then you've probably heard of the Arctic Ring of Life, the project that put this zoo on the zoo enthusiast radar. And before the Penguin Conservation Center, this is where you went to experience magical moments at the Detroit Zoo. The Arctic Ring represents one environment with two seasons. The warmer months are depicted with a grassy tundra, and the colder months are depicted with a blanket of faux ice. Combined, they give more space to any other polar bear in the nation. The Arctic Ring of Life has an underwater tunnel of its own. Impressive, but the designers were just showing off when they made this into an opportunity to let the predator and prey not only see each other, but it's designed to look like what is now sea otters, not seals, and polar bears swimming in the same pool. I just gave you plenty of reasons to visit this place, but it doesn't go without its criticisms. The Penguin Center aside, the zoo doesn't dramatically change, and from what I've heard from regulars, they've lost a lot of key species over the years. I already covered that a good chunk of the zoo is just the same exhibit over and over again, and these exhibits are so large and detailed, again, that it's impossible to see some of these animals. If you have a regular zoo member that says they've never seen the wolves, that's not the best way to get people to come back to your zoo. The Penguin Center and the Arctic Ring of Life have a history of being closed, so heads up on those. I don't really care too much about those problems as much as I did with the geographical mix-ups. North American sandhill cranes were mixed with Afro-Eurasian white storks in the Asian forest. Japanese macaques are in Africa, a tree kangaroo, a cassowary, and an African tortoise are in the American grasslands. Even though the swamp monkeys are right next to the African apes, the map still says they're part of Asia. Zoos are, or at least should be, all about education, and these misplacements are the exact opposite of that. Detroit has some of the best exhibits I've ever seen, but these issues are why I don't really have any desire to see the entire park for a fourth time. That being said, these criticisms really don't apply to anyone that doesn't make zoos their personality, like myself. But to the real world, these are not really problems. This is only one of, I think, around two places I've been to where I didn't feel sympathy for a single animal. Do I recommend the Detroit Zoo? Absolutely. When you do make a visit, again, you will not regret it. To some people, I imagine they'll say there's a decent amount of walking, but the zoo is very easy to navigate through. There are no hills, and I saw the entire park in under four hours. That will end another zoo breakdown and critique on this channel. And until next time, please stay tuned for more, stay wild, and thank you all for watching Zoo Tours.